Welcome to week two of 2020 for 2020. Uh, much, thank you, yes. Uh, much of Jesus' ministry was all about helping people to see more clearly, either literally or spiritually, and even sometimes both at the same time. And so we're actually spending three weeks here attempting to see more clearly both as individual followers of Jesus Christ, but also collectively as a church, particularly as we go into 2020. Uh, speaking of 2020, I don't know if you find it hard to believe, I find it hard to believe that it's already time for the Olympics again. And so we will have the Olympics again in 2020. And the reason I say that is we actually have a young man here among us at the branch who's been visiting the last several weekends who's in town training to participate in the Olympic trials. Some of the trials are going to be here in town as they prepare for the Olympics later next summer. I think about the Olympics and I think about this subject of seeing clearly and vision and I think about a man by the name of Matt Emmons. Matt Emmons was one trigger pull away from winning a gold medal in the 2004 Olympics in Athens. Matt was in the uh, three-position rifle competition, and he was in first place going into the last stage of this competition. The three-position rifle competition is a competition where you fire at a target from three different positions, first on your belly, then on your knees, and then standing upright. Emmons was so far ahead that his last bullet just needed to hit the target. It didn't even have to come anywhere near the bullseye. It could land anywhere on the face of the targets, and he'd have the gold medal locked up. And so when he fired his third shot, something strange happened. No score lights appeared on the scoreboard, and he thought that was odd, and then three officials approached him in their Olympic red jackets, and he thought that they were about to tell him, hey, the scoreboard has malfunctioned, you have hit the target. But the truth is they'd come to deliver him a different kind of news. He was in shock when the officials informed him that he had hit the wrong target. He was standing in lane two, and after he had moved into his final position, Emmons mistakenly fired at the target in lane three, and he scored a zero. He fell all the way from first to eighth place and didn't even win a medal. And Emmons would have to wait four more years and endure another set of Olympic trials just to get in position to have another shot at a medal. And Emmons' story is sobering. Because it reminds us that no matter how well we may shoot or how talented we are or how hard we work or how passionate we are or even how well-intentioned we are, it doesn't really matter if we're aimed at the wrong target. There are different adages and sayings out there that capture this sentiment. Some people will talk about in the world of corporate America climbing a particular ladder only to find out that when they got to the top of it, it was leaning against the wrong wall. Other people will talk about their fear of succeeding at something that doesn't really matter in the end and failing at the things that really do matter. And the point of all this is to say, what we aim for as a church, what we aim for as individual followers of Jesus matters. And so we return again to the words of Jesus that we began soaking in last weekend because in them, I believe we find the target that Jesus gives us as his followers. Picking up in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 16, the gospel writer Matthew writes, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. 
And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And so last week we saw how these words really reveal Jesus' ultimate intention, his ultimate desire for every human being on the face of the earth. And his desire for every human being on the face of the earth is for all people to be his disciples, his followers. In Jesus' day and age, a disciple was somebody who spends time with another person and follows that person's life and teaching so closely in order to become like them, in order to learn to do what they do and to become what they are. This concept of discipleship that's very ancient was part of Jesus' world. He's lifting this concept out and he's talking about this, that his desire is for everyone to follow him, to be his disciple. And this desire for people to follow him is not rooted in his ego. Some people who are cynical may think that it is that it's rooted in his ego, this idea of just wanting everybody to follow him. The truth is it's not rooted in his ego, it's rooted in his love. Jesus is like the teacher commanding students to follow her in the middle of a school fire or in the middle of a school shooting. That teacher's not on an ego trip when the teacher is commanding students to follow her. That teacher is desiring to lead them in a direction that will lead them to life and not death. Jesus said in John 10 and verse 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That's his desire for every human being on the face of the earth. That's the roots behind this call to where he desires all people to be his disciples. And this is so important to note, Jesus didn't come to start a religion. Jesus didn't come to start a church. He came that human beings may have life and have it to the full. And his target isn't church membership. His target isn't church attendance. Those things are not the end. They are part of the means to the end. They're not the purpose, but they serve the purpose. And the purpose for which he came was to bring life, and that's life before the grave and life beyond the grave. And life before the grave and life beyond the grave is found through following him. That's his desire for every human being. Some people might say, wait a second, I thought he came to save us from our sins. Absolutely. That is part of how you come into the fullness of life. Absolutely. That's true. But he came that we may have life and have it to the full. And his desire is for every person to follow him in light of this. He said, that's his desire. What's his plan? Well, his plan is to use those who are currently his disciples to help make disciples. And that's our mission as disciples of Jesus. That's our target to make disciples of Jesus. Now, just to be clear, to make disciples doesn't mean that we're making people do something that they don't want to do. This isn't forced baptisms again like Nacho Libre or something like that. I know I'm dating myself here. Nor does it mean that we're running an assembly line like human beings or tacos or or burgers or cars that are mass produced as disciples. Our mission is to help people to come to Jesus, to grow in Jesus, to live like Jesus. One incredible definition of discipleship uh, was by the late Dallas Willard, and I thought it was so good when he said, a disciple is someone whose goal is to live their life the way Jesus would live their life if he were them. Say that again. A disciple is someone whose goal is to live their life the way Jesus would live their life if he were them. We'll talk more about that next week. But Jesus desires all people to become his disciples. And this desire is rooted in his love. Our mission is to help people come to Jesus, to grow in Jesus, to live like Jesus. Now, someone may say, now, wait a second, Chris. Shouldn't the target really be just us being disciples ourselves instead of worrying about other people being disciples? And I get that. We got to walk it as well as talk it. And here's the truth. The real truth is you and I won't really seek to help anyone else in regard to becoming a disciple of Jesus if we're not first living into it ourselves. And I'll tell you why. It's only after you live into it some that you actually become convinced enough of it to want to share it with other people. That's really how you get there. It's only after you live into it some that you actually become convinced of it enough that you'll want to share it with other people. 
But when it's all said and done, part of being a disciple is to help make disciples. Or to put it another way, a disciple is a disciple maker. I saw this picture the other day. I thought it was so curious to me. It's a picture about being a good neighbor. And I love the caption, you know. Please don't ever allow yourself to become the person on the left. But I think about that just as you look at that picture in terms of helping someone else when it comes to helping them become or grow as a disciple of Jesus. Some people live their whole lives as though the person on the left is the target. The door on the left is the target. I'll just deal with my own path. When the truth is, a disciple of Jesus is concerned about clearing a path for the person next to him, particularly a path for them to Jesus. And by the way, I just would ask even right now, as you think about 2020, who is someone next to you, so to speak, in life? Maybe you work with, maybe you work out with them, maybe they're underneath your own roof. Maybe you have some kind of relationship with them. Who is somebody, so to speak, right next to you that could use their path being cleared? You can't make them walk up the steps. You can't make them walk down the steps. But you can help clear the path and keep the path clear. And who might that person be in your life right now? We'll circle back around to that later. Jesus is telling his disciples the target to aim for, the making of disciples of his. Now... It was Mark Twain that made this line quite famous. He said, it's not the things in the Bible I don't understand that bother me. It's the things I do understand that bother me. <laughs> and to say that this is the target for being a disciple of Jesus can be quite daunting. Because the first question a lot of us think is, who me? Helping someone to become or grow as a disciple of Jesus? And all kinds of objections might flow from that. One is this, I can't go to a foreign country right now. But remember what I said last week, this is about living with intention more than having a change of location. The way it's written in the Gospel of Matthew reads more like, and as you're going along, make disciples. In the original language of Matthew, that participle is a Word for, the word go is a participle. Just as you're going along into all the world, make disciples. This is about living with a specific intention where you are and not always going to a specific location. I think about one of, a, one of our brothers here, Philip Van, his wife Morgan, their whole family. Philip Van is a first-class iPhone repairman, has a thriving business. And I think about Pam Cope, who was in our small group for years, and Pam Cope had an iPhone on the fritz, and she Googled iPhone repair people, and she got referred to Philip Van. Philip Van happened to be at his house with his family on this particular day. When she called him after hours, he says, if you're willing to come to my house, I'll fix your iPhone. Is that service or what? And so she goes over to his house, and there Philip is with his wife and his family, and she's there just waiting for him to fix her iPhone, and she's looking around on the shelves and notices a Bible on the shelf and begins to strike up a conversation with him. Before you know it, she invites him to check out the branch sometime. And wouldn't you know it, Philip comes sometime, and then he brings his wife, and then he brings his mother, and then he begins to bring his family. And before you know it, you see several of them becoming disciples of Jesus Christ over time among us. And just think, all it took for a seed to be sowed was for Pam to live with intention where she was while she's getting her iPhone prepared, repaired. For some of us, we're helping to make and pour our lives into disciples who are right underneath our roof. Those are the disciples right now that you're helping to make. The ones who are right underneath your roof. It could be a, a seven-year-old boy like the one I heard about Right here in our church, a little while back, I was touched by the story of one of our own little boys here. He, he's being bullied at school, and it's being documented. And what does his father here report to me? That the other night, the boy wanted to pray for the other boy who was bullying him. And it's not a prayer for lightning to strike. It's not a prayer simply for his own protection. It's a prayer for the heart of the one that's doing the bullying. 
Now, that's a disciple being raised right under someone's roof here at the branch. This isn't to say that there doesn't need to be meetings with a teacher or administration. This isn't to say that there don't need to be things set in place to minimize bullying. We understand that. It's just to say, here you have a young man who's already learning to approach conflict like a disciple of Jesus at six or seven years of age. And all I'm saying is, some of us, the places where we need to live with more intentionality are with the people underneath our own roof. It's not always about going to a certain location. It's about living with a certain intention where we are. Maybe the objection isn't that. Maybe the objection is, hey, Chris, I don't have it all together myself as a disciple of Jesus. And I got great news for you. Perfection is not required for this mission. If it was, Jesus would have nobody to work with. Did you notice Matthew 28, 17? It mentions that even while they're worshiping the resurrected Jesus, some are still dealing with doubts. The very first disciples still had their doubts in the presence of the resurrected Jesus, and Jesus doesn't let their doubts stop him from entrusting them with his mission. Don't let your doubts stop you from receiving his mission. In fact, as the story unfolds in the book of Acts, which I showed you last week, that you just don't see their doubts on display in Acts, you'll see their sins at times. And Jesus doesn't let their doubts or their sins or their shortcomings stop him from giving them a mission. We're not perfect. We're all disciples in process, as we like to say. We're not perfect, but we are his. Or maybe the objection is, Chris, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I would tell you, Jesus never expects us to do it alone. In this passage, he's talking to his disciples as a group. He never sends them out one by one in the Gospels. At least he sends them out two by two. Sometimes he sends them out in groups of three, 12, 72, or even 500. This is a team sport. We're in this together. We do this together with others. And I would remind you again what I told you last week. None of us have to fulfill every letter from A to Z in the alphabet of somebody's journey and transformation with Jesus. Man, you just step in and you be faithful with the letter that you're to play in the alphabet of their journey. Amen? We're not in this by ourselves. Even more than that, after commissioning his disciples to make disciples, Jesus then promises his presence with his disciples as they go about this mission to the very end of the age. This is a co-mission. Some of you grew up in church. You heard this passage referred to as the Great Commission. One word, it is a word, commission, but you sometimes need to put a dash in there and be reminded it's a great commission, C-O-M-I-S-S-I-O-N. It's a commission. We're doing this with others, and even more importantly, we're doing this with the presence of the Spirit of Jesus himself. I think it's interesting that the Gospel of Matthew opens up with a reminder about the birth of Jesus that we always talk about this time of year as we approach Christmas, that Jesus' other name is Emmanuel, and Emmanuel means what? God with us. Matthew opens up with a reminder that in Jesus you have God with us. And Matthew closes with a reminder that in Jesus God is still with us as we fulfill the mission of Jesus. None of us are doing this alone. Which leads me to where I want to camp with you now in my remaining time. I want to call your attention to the very first sentence Jesus says before commissioning his disciples. And it's what I call the great conviction behind the great commission. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's the first thing he says. That's his opener with them when he meets them on this mountain. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is what he says before he says, therefore, go and make disciples. A lot of people just want to jump to the therefore, go and make the disciples, but that therefore is therefore for a reason. (laughs) There's a great conviction behind the great commission. Jesus shows up and he opens with, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is a stunning claim he makes. And two things come to mind. The first is this, he has the right to ask for this. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to him. He has the right to ask for this. 
He's not just Lord of the church. He's the Lord of history, the Lord of governments, the Lord of nations, the Lord of the universe. He's the Lord of every realm and every dimension, seen and unseen. All authority has been given to him. He was born a king at birth. He was validated as a king by his resurrection. He will return as a king. And the question for every human being is, will I receive him as a king? And we like to sing this time of year, let earth receive her king. But I would tell on you, let the disciples go first. By the way, Jesus, in just a moment, will talk about one of the ways that disciples are made, and he mentions baptism. This is one of the things that one is confessing through their baptism. They're basically saying, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to you, Jesus. I agree with this. Jesus, you are Lord, and I acknowledge you have the right to rule my life. Let earth receive her king, and let it begin with me. He has the right to ask for this. And this is what he wants to do with all of his authority. It's all aimed towards the making of disciples. Secondly, he has the power available for this. When he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, he has the power available for this. What does this mean? This means there is more than enough power for you and me to become a disciple, to grow as a disciple, and to live as a disciple. There is more than enough power for you and me to be a disciple maker ourselves. Let me tell you what, if all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus, and this Jesus is with you, you have more going for you than you realize in your journey to grow as a disciple. And in even in your journey to influence someone else. Let me leave us with two takeaways. The first is this. Living as a disciple is rooted in this conviction about his authority. Living as a disciple is rooted in this conviction about his authority. Here's the deal. The reality is, I will not follow Jesus' instructions over the long haul about how to live my life. I will not follow Jesus' instructions over the long haul about how to deal with life without me truly believing that all authority really has been given to him, without me truly believing that he really has all the power to help me do what he's asking me to do. Next week, we'll talk about that phrase in verse 19, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Jesus had a lot to say about a lot of things, and some of those things that he asked us to do can feel daunting at times. Amen? Now, what's daunting may differ from person to person. For some of us, it may be what he has to say about money and wealth. For others of us, it may be what he has to say about forgiveness and loving our enemies. For others of us, it may be what he has to say about doing things in secret and not seeking the limelight. For others of us, it may be what he has to say about how we deal with conflict. For others of us, it may be something he has to say about lust or anger. Sooner or later, you run into some things that Jesus says and you just, you wrestle with it and you're like, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if it's possible for me to become this kind of person. I don't know if it's possible. But at the end of the day, the question will be, do I really believe he has the power to help me become this kind of person and to help me do this kind of thing? And if all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus and Jesus is with me, then change is possible. So a few weeks ago, I told some of you about the phenomenon of wealthy people in North Korea buying refrigerators. (laughs) Refrigerators becoming these, these icons that stand for their success and their prosperity. And yet the irony is Many people there are using these glamorous, state-of-the-art, two and three thousand American dollar refrigerators. They're they're using these glamorous, state-of-the-art refrigerators as their bookcases in their homes. And you open up the door of the fridge, and there's books in there. And you think, why are they doing that? And it's because they've got a power grid in North Korea that's so 
undependable, that's so antiquated, they can't count on the power grid always working, giving the fridge power to preserve the food that they put in it, but they got to do something with the refrigerator, and so they're using the refrigerators as designer bookcases. Open up the fridge door, and you'll find books. And you may say to yourself, well, why is that? Why are you even telling us that? Because I'm telling you the refrigerators serving as bookcases remind us that when you can't count on the power being there, you wind up serving default missions and lesser purposes. And this is what happens to people over time who lose this awareness, who lose this sense that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus and this Jesus is with me, eventually they grow so discouraged over time when they become disconnected by that reality that they give up the dream of serving the purpose and the call and the mission for which they were intended and they settle for lesser purposes and lesser calls in their life. And that's why it's so critical to stay rooted in this awareness that all authority has been given to Jesus and he is with us. Us, a disciple of Jesus Christ, is somebody who is seeking to live in light of this conviction in everything they say and everything they do that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. That what he's asking me to do and how I live my life, what he's asking me to do and even to be an influence of others is possible because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus and this Jesus is with me. This is the story behind why we pray the way we do. This is the story behind why we pray for hearts that might be resistant. This is the story why we pray for doors to open. This is the story for why we pray for breakthroughs to happen because we know that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus and this Jesus is with us. Speaking of default missions, this leads me to the second takeaway and it's this. Making disciples is an expression of our submission to his authority. It's an expression of our submission to his authority. If all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him, and he's telling his disciples to make disciples of him, then that's the target we're to aim for. This is not the great suggestion. We are to make disciples. And disciples include being disciple makers. What does it mean to make disciples? We'll meditate on that together next week. But for this week, it's just enough to be able to get the target before us. He has the right to tell us what the target is. And he has the power available for us to hit the target to become a disciple, to grow as a disciple, to live as a disciple to be a disciple maker. Oh, I think of Kenneth Ulmer, listening to him years ago when he was passing through town, a marvelous pastor, pastored a church at the Forum in Los Angeles for many, many years. Kenneth Ulmer tells the story about being in uh, graduate school, having young kids, preaching in his church in the early years, and he didn't have time to go to class all the time. He's a smart man. He showed up for class, and he just decided it's graduate school. I'm just going to get the syllabus on the first day, and I'm going to figure out what the assignment is because some grad classes, you get one grade, and the only grade you get is for a paper you write, and that's the grad class. There are no tests. You find out about your assignment the first day. It's in the syllabus. So he shows up. He gets a syllabus the first day, and he walks out of the class. He never returns to the whole class the whole semester. He's a busy dad, busy pastor, doesn't have time to go to class. He shows up the last day of the class to turn in his project. It's one paper, the entire grade for the class. Turns in his paper, leaves, decides to circle back around a few days later to pick up his paper. These were the day and age before everything was digitized. and You could go and pick up your paper outside the professor's office right before Christmas and find out the grade you got on your paper. He showed up to pick up his paper. It was in a box. He looked at it, and he got kind of excited when he saw the writing at very first. Great writing. Clear, salient points. Captivating illustrations at times. Not the assignment. <laughs> F. F. 
And it was a powerful moment for him. When he just began to realize that man, no matter how industrious you are, no matter how sharp you are, no matter how passionate you are, no matter how well intended you are, if it's not the targets, if it's not the assignments, it doesn't matter as much as you think. Making disciples is an expression of our submission to his authority. What does this mean? What this may mean for somebody as a parent is to realize, you know what? Part of our submission to his authority is to provide an environment that gives our children an opportunity to become disciples, to grow as disciples, and to live as disciples. You can't make your child choose. You can't do that. But you can provide environments, and you can clear the path. And for you right now, this is the target and what it looks like in your life. What does it look like for us as a church? That's something we need to be aware of because it's entirely possible for churches to veer off course and drift to other targets and other default missions. It's entirely possible for pastors and preachers to do it and what they do. And I want desperately, desperately, to submit to the authority of Jesus and to go for the target that he's asking us to aim for. Amen? And that's why I told you last week that I desperately want us to be able to draw lines with everything we do, to draw lines back to one of three things that this hopefully is either helping somebody choose to become a disciple or maybe this is helping somebody grow as a disciple or maybe this is an opportunity for somebody to live as a disciple and do something that Jesus would do together with other disciples to make a difference. Now, some of you might be thinking, Chris, man, if that's the target, I am so far off. And I want to tell you, I feel that myself sometimes. So let's circle all the way around to Matt Eamons. You know what Matt Eamons found after aiming at the wrong target and making a mess of things? You know what he found? He found love. The next day, he's commiserating in in an area where Olympians were gathering just to socialize between events, and he's completely despondent, and up walks a woman. She's an Olympic shooter for a European team. She felt such compassion for him. She tried to encourage him. Her name was Katrina, and of all things... They wound up falling in love, getting married, and today they live in Colorado 15 years later and have a couple kids. You say, why are you telling me this? Because I'll tell you this, love is what you'll find when you come to grips with all the times in your life that you've aimed for all the wrong targets. You'll find love. I'm not talking about the love of another human being. I'm talking about the love of Jesus. Because the same Jesus that commissioned his disciples in the midst of all their doubts, in the midst of all their shortcomings, is the same Jesus who commissions us today. And even though we change, he doesn't, nor does his mission. And I'm mindful of, of what the Gospel of John says when it says the very, some of the very first words that Jesus ever said to Peter were the words, follow me. You ought to read it sometime. He says to Peter, follow me. And then you get to the end of the Gospel of John. After so much history has happened between Peter and Jesus, guess what some of the last words are that Jesus ever said to Peter in the Gospel of John? Follow me. And a whole lifetime lies in between those two calls. His call doesn't change, nor has his aim nor has his grace. And I would tell you that the same Jesus that was calling you to follow him when you were nine years old is the same Jesus that's calling you to follow him at 59, 69, and 79. His call hadn't changed. His aim hadn't changed. His grace hadn't changed. And so we're taking some time to fix our aim We're taking some time to get some 2020 for 2020 because after all, he came that you might have a new beginning and that's why a new year follows Christmas. Christmas makes a new year possible, not just on your calendar, but in your life. That's why we're talking about what we're talking about right now. It's time for me to get out of the way. I'm gonna leave you with two questions to ponder as we take communion together. The first question is this, what's one area in your life 
where you desire to reflect his authority. It's one area in your life that you're thinking, Lord, I long for your authority to be on display more in this way in my life. And it may be over how you deal with money. It may be over how you deal with greed. It may be over how you're dealing with purity issues. It may be over how you're dealing with conflict in your life right now. What's one area where you desire to reflect his authority? And then secondly, who's one person that you will pray for and be more intentional with when it comes to their relationship with Jesus? Who's next to you that could use a step or two to be cleared between them and Jesus? You can't make them take the steps, but you can clear the path. All are welcome at the table of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your presence in this place right now. And we say, even over our doubts, we say over our sins, over our regrets and over our failures, we say over all of our memories where we've aimed for the wrong target in our lives, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you, Jesus. We long to live more in light of it. We long to pray more like it. We long to love more like it. So we ask for the grace of your spirit to be among us now. And I declare again that we've all made decisions that took us out of your will, but not one of us has ever made a decision that takes us out of your reach. And your reach is wider than our sin, is deeper than our failure, is higher than our shame. And we thank you for your ministry of helping us to see clearly and not giving up on us. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus and eat and drink to these things. Amen.